In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You have the title here of the message. We're continuing on part four of the Vine series, The Benefits of Abiding. You can go to YouTube or to Facebook. You will see part three, two, and one. It's all there. We have, uh, as we have reviewed, we talked about the, one of the key words. We talked about fruit, no fruit, fruits, and more fruits. And uh, we have discussed, also if you look at slide number two, the work, the process. We talked about the vine dresser and his relationship with the vine, Jesus and his father. We looked about uh, the pruning techniques and what is pruning about and why it is so necessary. You see some of the descriptions why pruning is so important. But basically it reduces the hard dependence upon the flesh to serve God, to do things, to live our Christian life based on our own uh, abilities. The vine dresser has a lot of work. This is what we look like. This is really a representation of our life, the vine. Uh, and then the vine dresser has a lot of work to direct the branch, to cut whatever is not necessary. And here you see he's looking for fruit. The vine dresser is looking for um, proof of life. He's looking for potential of, of life. When he sees that there is potential, he chop so that th there will no be wasted sap anywhere else than to maximize the fruitfulness of the vine. So this is your life. This is you, and this is the beginning of the potential that he sees in you when he sees potential in your life. He will chop. He will chop through the word. We saw that uh, the pruning knife of the vine dresser is the word of God. You are clean by the words that I spoke to you, Jesus says. The work of the, uh, the correction of the word of God, the life giving, the new direction is the pruning knife of the Lord. The, the, the vine dresser watches for fruit buds. Next slide. We saw also in this the, the except you abide. We saw one message about abiding. What, what is abiding? What does it mean? Do I abide? And the, the meaning of that. And we, we use the, as an illustration, like a graft. Like when you graft a, a new shoot into an already existing vine. To, to uh, ex uh, try to explain this coming to life, this becoming together. After a while, this shoot will resemble the branch. The life of this vine will take part into this one and will produce whatever is necessary. There will be a likeness. There will be the same life, the union of life and between the fruitfulness. And then we saw that the, the Lord Jesus gave us a very strong contrast in order to stress even more the importance of abiding, dwelling, remaining, continuing, persevering. Because he says, except you abide. Just as the branch cannot produce fruit by itself, except or unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless or except you abide in me. And then he gave us the, the strong, before he, he went on, and today we will continue from after that, from verse 7, but he gave us this very strong picture. If a man abide not in me, and then he says he will be thrown away. He will wither, he will be picked up and withdraw. So you have this, this amazing contrast. It's this or it's that. This is either what you are looking for a la a, uh, like or this is what you are going to look like. And this is part of our choice or decision to abide in the vine, to listen to the word of our master. It's, we have the, the choice. If a man abide not in me, this is our future, and if we abide in Him, this is our future. So we have, we have looked at a lot of pictures uh, uh, to, uh, to help us. We even seen a video about the, the, how to prune in winter and how to prune in the springtime. We've already saw that in previous message. So this morning, we want to uh, continue in this, in this message with the benefits of abiding. Let's look to the next uh, slide. Oh, just one point before we go to the next. Here you have also another contrast. It's like if you abide or if you don't abide. Apart from me, you cannot do anything. But if you abide, I can do all things. You can do nothing or I can do all things. 
It's a very different future. It's a very different way of living. It's a very different way to appreciate our Christian life. We have people who are not really committed, excited, on fire for God. And other people are excited. They give their life and they just, every day is a thrill. Every day is a challenge. Every day is something happening. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm abiding. He strengthens me. His life it comes into me and, and it strengthens me. I can do it. I can produce fruit. I can serve His purpose. Or I can do nothing. Either one. I can struggle on my own. I can try my best to be a good person. I can try this. I can try that. Without me, He cannot do nothing. Say amen if you agree with all this. Amen. Anyway, you, you agree or disagree, it doesn't really matter to me. You agree to the words of Jesus or that. So settle your account with him. All right, next slide. This is our text for today, basically. We have uh, four points here that will be coming in each of these verses the describing the four benefits of abiding. I, I'm starting with verse 2 because it's, it belongs there. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they produce even more. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish or will or desire, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We're looking at the benefits of abiding. And by the way, the word abiding, we said the word fruits is one of the key words, but the dominant key word is abiding or remaining or being one with remaining connected to it comes 11 times mentioned in these short verses over here it's very important because abiding means that we keep united in fellowship with Jesus Christ that his life can work in and through us to produce work that's why we abide, that the life of Christ, it is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. His work is being produced uh, through, through me. People may ask, uh, how do I know if I am abiding? Because this is, as I said in the opening uh, messages, and I repeated a few times, this is a disturbing text. When you come to John chapter 15, it does something to you. It makes you question, am I abiding? Am I a true disciple? Am I bearing fruit? Uh, it, it's a disturbing text. And it is an encouraging text as well. But it's a text that doesn't leave you just uh, indifferent. It, it, it makes you search uh, your own heart. And that, that's why. So, so am I really abiding? How do I know if I am abiding? Do I have a special feeling? No, I don't have a special feeling. It's not going to show me if I am abiding or not. It's independent from feeling. What will show you that you are abiding or not are the evidences, some very clear evidences, four evidences or four benefits that you will receive from abiding. The first one is, that, that is the one we are going to talk about today, the assurance of prayer answered. That is the one that you will see. Is there prayer in your life? Is there something happening in prayer in your life? Is there like a, uh, an ongoing prayer life? And sometimes you, you feel that God is with you and then you have a devotion and you are connected. So the assurance of prayer answered. It's not a prayer of defeat. It's not the prayer of doubts. It's a prayer that you, you keep on praying because you know God because you know God loves you because you know God will do something because you know God is working in the background there's this assurance that, that you have that's one of the first one the second one is a greater degree of fruitfulness we'll see it in the coming weeks deeper love for Christ and for other believers and joy of greater degrees or of lasting joy okay 
slide number five, next one. Look at these uh, two verses because I'm going to speak on verse seven today. But verse six, as I said, is, is important because it, it makes a connection with a contrast. The contrast is there. Jesus finished talking about anyone who does not remain in me. Any, the one, the man who abides not. And then immediately, if you abide. So he's going to, to switch and show, show the difference and stress the result of that. And he's going to stress the result with the most astounding advantage of remaining in him. This is absolutely mind-blowing. And I know you're looking at me this morning like, what are you talking about? But think about it. Think about what God, what Jesus is really telling them and telling you this morning. Ask whatever you will. That is taking a big, a big chance. Do you remember Herod when he was looking at this beautiful young dancer? And he asked her, that's a very dangerous question. Maybe husband and wife sometimes we say, I, I told my wife, you can ask me anything you want. Uh, half of what I belong belongs to you. You can take your half. <laughs> Ask whatever you will. It's, it's a dangerous thing. You will not promise that to anybody or everybody. So when this Erod uh, told this lady, ask whatever you want, even half of my kingdom, what do you want? I will give it to you. She says, I want the head of John the Baptist. That's a dangerous request. So here Jesus is giving you and I the same astounding privilege ask whatever you will think about it I just want to just let let it sink let it sink because this is very disturbing because you wonder I just can't make it I just can't imagine this can't be this is too good to be true not really for me I, I, I don't know how to pray that I don't know if I could dare to pray this kind of prayer. This is too big for me. Whatever, what does that mean? And, or there, there might be also some confusion, really. What does that mean? Is that a blank check? I can ask anything. If you would go to certain type of churches, they will tell you, ask for a big car, diamond rings, a big house, a boat, or an exotic vacation. Ask for anything, click your finger, just believe it, and you will receive it. There would be churches or preachers that would take this verse and make it sound like, wow, like this. But we look at this verse, and I want to give you some peace this morning. This is our fourth message. What we are stressing in that uh, sentence here is coming out of three previous messages. We are bringing this in the context of who spoke to who and with conditions and what was the context of their conversation. What was the intention of the one who de declared this, this word? So that you can rest. I'm not going to give you crazy ideas this morning. I'm going to remain faithful to the words of Jesus this morning. Are you okay with that? Yes. All right. Amen. Let's try to do this then. This is amazing. This is amazing. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you it shall come to pass for you that's the literal meaning it shall come to pass for you just ask and it will come to pass for you there are two parts in this verse as you already are intelligent enough to have seen that already a condition and a result there's a result ask and then you will receive anything you ask for Okay, that's really wonderful. But there's a condition to that. If you abide in me and if my words abide in you. Okay, condition and result. Hallelujah. It's a most amazing promise. And we will see in this text that prayer is for fruit bearing. This is the purpose why Jesus gives us this most amazing uh, promise. Remember what's happening here. 
And chapter 13 and 14, this is the last night I'm with you. I'm leaving you. You're on your own after this time. They're confused. They're anxious. Jesus called them from their job. And they have followed him for three years. Until now, they haven't asked anything. They didn't need to learn how to pray. Jesus was doing the praying. Jesus was doing the talking. Jesus was working the works. They were just tagging along and learning and observing and uh, being taught and everything. Until now, you will read that in chapter 15 and 16. Until now, in chapter 16, until now you have asked nothing. Ask your father in my name. He will give you anything. That's what Jesus is going to tell them even more. So what Jesus is telling them here, when they are confused and anxious about their future, what is going to happen to us, he's going to give them immediately the deeper meaning of prayer, the means, the tools that they need to go on without him being physically with them. This is amazing. And this is true for you and for me, it's giving them immediately, as the solution to their problem, the deeper meaning of prayer. Say amen. amen. Prayer is the means given to the disciples to bear fruit. When they do bear fruit, according to this text, and verse 8, if you look at verse 8 here, by this my Father is glorified. If you look at the logic of this, you abide in me, my words abide in you, you ask whatever you will, it will come to pass for you. By this, the Father is glorified. So when you bear fruit, because you have prayed for fruit, you have prayed that God do amazing work, like a, something that is more powerful, something that you could not have done, the Father is glorified for two different reasons. He's glorified first because you are bearing fruit. You are showing that you are truly his disciples. Your good actions, your Christian character, your likeness to Christ, your love for one another. And there are many things that are associating you and bearing fruits. So when, when your life reflects this kind of life in Christ, that you abide in Christ, the character of Christ is being formed in you, the Father is glorified by your fruitfulness, by your life's effect. Number two, when you pray this amazing prayer that requires a miracle to take place that you cannot achieve by yourself, God answered that prayer. He is glorified by the answer of prayer. He is glorified because only Him could have answered such a prayer. Not you. You are there to pray that. You are there to believe it. And the Father came through. So people are that's amazing. Think of all the miracles. Think of all the, the, the things that happened with the, the apostles and the uh, Paul missionary journey. I was thinking of that as an example. When they went to a place and these pagan people were there, and then there was the, this, this man there that had, uh, couldn't walk, and Paul saw that the, he had faith. He says, stand, and he was healed, and everybody wanted to worship them. They thought they were, they were God. So they announced the gospel, and all of them believed in Christ. So there is a miracle that just takes place, and this miracle glorifies God. So there are two things here. When your life bears fruit, God's glorified. When God answers this amazing miracle prayer of yours, God is glorified as well. And look at the next verse, in verse 16, for bearing fruit. Look at what Jesus says. The same thing, but it goes a little bit further. I have chosen you. I have appointed you to go and produce fruit that lasts. I want you to, that in your daily life, this is, this is what your daily life should be like. You go to work, you relate to people, everything that you do, you bear fruit. You speak of me. You lead people. You help someone to reconcile. You, you bless uh, uh, the, the poor. Uh, you, you, you help uh, a broken marriage to be restored. Your words, your actions, something takes place. And you are producing fruit that lasts because you have prayed. Because you have dared to pray. You are there to pray this amazing prayer. And the, the Father gave it to you. This is another uh, result of that. Jesus says the same thing. Whatever you ask. Again it is repeated. The Father in my name. He will give it to you. This is an amazing answer to prayer. He wants you to be 
fruitful. Now that brings you to another application. This is obvious that it is this kind of promise, this most wonderful promise, as a context and as conditions. Abide in Christ, the word abides in you, and the context is fruit bearing. Your life flow with God's intention for your life. You are not sterile in your life. You are productive. You, you are a Christian that lives a Christian life. And there are some fruits in, 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 in your life because of that. So the, the point here is that if you are not devoted to fruit bearing, maybe this prayer is not for you. You see that what I'm saying? If you are not devoted to God's uh, interest, to God's work, to God if you are not abiding, if you live your life independent from God, don't claim that promise. It's not for you. That's very clear. It is for those if you abide. If my words abide in you, you are filled with my words, then it is. This particular amazing promise comes with a condition. It is not for the gratifying also of selfish natural desires. We see it in the next slide for his verse. James, when you pray for things, you don't get them because you want them for the wrong reasons, for your own pleasure. The expression for your own pleasure is, means to squander or to waste on your passions or selfish desire. God does not hear prayer like this. This is clear. It's written in the Bible. God does not hear. You pray for things you don't get them. Because God will not grant it to you for that simple reason that it is mentioned. You, you are wasting it. You are squandering it on yourself, not on God's interest. And this is not to say that God does not answer prayers for uh, daily needs, uh, uh, for money at the end of the month, for uh, paying the bills. God will honor these kind of things. Because in the Bible, like we're talking about John chapter 15, verse 7, but in the Bible there are many, many, many promises about all sorts of prayer. This afternoon in our Bible study, one of our key verse will be Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Pray on any occasions, on every occasion, pray with all sorts of prayers. So, so there's all sorts of prayer for anything. Do not be anxious for anything in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, but in everything present you all sorts of requests, thanksgiving and petitions to God. And God will keep your mind at peace and everything. So there are many other promises, but that kind of promises, it's for those who who follow the condition. Amen? Amen? So the first evidence that we see in this text is that you become effective in Christ for, for the interest of, of the Lord. Your life accomplish something. It could be in the very little things of everyday life. You don't have to be a missionary or a pastor. You can be a mother. Colossians chapter, I don't have it here, but just listen. Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do in word or in deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus so everything it's in the everything of your life that the Christian prove that he is truly a disciple it's not only on Sundays not only in the great things okay how many of you have already been on a mission trip for two weeks a short-term mission trip oh I've been a missionary on a mission trip for two weeks but there's still 50 weeks to go in the week with the everyday routine of our life. You know, you and I, basically, our life as a routine. You wake up every morning, you wash, brush your teeth, eat your breakfast, go to work. Come back at home, go to bed. Next day you do it. We have a lot of routine in our life. Things that you cannot avoid. If you have children, you have a family, your life has, is forced to have a routine. Uh, our life has a routine. So how can you believe that this promise will be for you in the routine of your life? Does that exclude? Or no, you are not excluded because it's only for the big things. No, it's not only for the big things, it's for the small things. Whatever you do. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So whether you eat or drink, oh, it's included also. Eat and drink. I can do that. 
I can do that every day. Eat and drink, okay? And when I eat and drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Okay, I can serve God. I can have a coffee with a friend, a colleague. I can invite someone to my home. I can offer a meal on Sunday afternoon. I can reach out to someone with eating and drinking. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God first or above all else and live righteously or seek the righteous living that comes by knowing God and he will give you everything you need above everything else. So if you want your prayers effective, begin to read and study the promises of God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Do a, a two click here on that slide, please. Two. Yeah, next. Look at these uh, two uh, things here. The Word of God, because in this text, the condition is if my words abide in you, isn't it? If you look at it, you will see the Word, so important. It transforms our prayer. And we will talk about the, the clause, uh, whatever you wish or whatever you will. Because when the Word fills me, abide in me, it gives me a humble view of myself. It, it works me in that direction. I don't become the focus. Because we saw in James chapter 4, you, you seek to waste a lot of money about yourself only for your own selfish pleasures. No. When you have the word in you, it will transform that. And you become less of yourself and more focused on God. You will also have an ex exalted view of Jesus. You discover him. You hear about his promise. You see what he is doing and all and everything. You also change your approach and understanding of your relation with the devil. You're not to be defeated. You're not under him anymore. You, you will, by the word of God alive and you, you will get to believe that the one inside of me is more, you know, more powerful than the one in the world, that you can have victory over that. If you continue here, you will get a, a knowledge of the path of love. The love is so important in the Bible. The more the word of God will be in your heart, you will recognize the, the importance of, of love and everything. The assurance of your standing with God. See, one of the key uh, points here in this promise that is implied in that. The person that has the word of God abiding in him, ask whatever he will. Why? Because he has the assurance of his standing with God. He is righteous. He is praying on the basis of Christ's mediation. Christ already has made a new way to heaven. Christ is the high priest who is interceding for us. That's true. Yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the middle part. <laughs> so, because we know that Jesus is this, this the high priest praying for us, we have the assurance that this amazing prayer is going to work because I'm praying on the basis of who I am and Christ, my standing with Christ. So it gives us more assurance. Hallelujah. The one who abides in Christ and his word, abides in his word, will naturally pray the kind of prayer that is in line with God's will. It cannot be different than that. Because it, the word abide in, in you. Amen? Hallelujah. So I'm going to skip a little bit. But another part also. This is the verb here. Ask whatever you will. It's an imperative. It's a command. Jesus in this text is not encouraging us to pray. He is commanding us to pray like that. So t t change, let's change our mind this morning. Because you look at a text like that. You see. That's too big. It's too much. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that I can pray this kind of prayer and it will come, whatever I wish. No, because if the word is really alive in me, it will direct. It will be inspiring me to pray whatever is in line. And we will talk a bit more about that. There is a command here. You know that many of the Christian young people, and I believe that many adults are not much better than doing much better than that. It says that 54% of Christian students confessed neglecting important areas of their life due to spending too much time on social media. And I believe that there's as many adults 
spending as almost as much time as the, the teens or young adults can, can do. Um, studies show that the average teenager and adults, I believe, sends and receives over 2,270 text messages a month. So I'm thinking, how many Facebook posts and WhatsApp message and text message do you uh, deal with? Because, you know, we're thinking on one day. And then one day multiplied by 30 days, then that will make quite a significant number of hours a number of uh, post and upload, reading, receiving. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of dirty politics. There's a lot of dirty things. And there's a lot of empty messages and humanistic, like some kind of positive, but humanistic at the same time. That has nothing to do with God. There's a lot of things. So imagine if you had a relationship of the same kind with the Bible. What is the best texting? The Bible text is the best texting. So, so get, get God to text you more than what you, you, you get. Imagine, we're talking about if you abide in me, and if my word, my texting, abide in you. And if you really read my text, if you really eat my text, if you are really connecting with my text, or at least as much as what you, you do, then to have a balance. Imagine what it would be like. I want to skip one point and go to another uh, little observation. At the beginning of John chapter 15, we read, abide in me and I and you. Is that right? Is like you abide in Jesus, Jesus abide in you. But here in verse 7, Jesus used a bit of the different uh, text to, to talk to us about this amazing promise. If you abide in me, he doesn't say, and I will abide in you, and then. He says, if you abide in me, in my word, abide in, in you. So that's his different. If my teaching abide in you, and control your thoughts and ideas, and if my teaching remain in you as your guide and inspiration, then ask whatever you will. It shall be done for you. Do you understand this? Like, how much is it controlling our mind? How much is it uh, inspiring in, in this? Verse 7, another great truth. I think you will really appreciate that. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, the word for words here, it's not the logos. You know, we're talking about the Greek text. Logos means the general message of the Bible. Like when you read the Bible in general, you're reading about Abraham, about Moses, about the Psalms, about uh, uh, Jesus being born. Just general information, general re revelation of the Bible. It's the word logos, the expression. God wants us to know that. But here's the word rima. The word Rima is very specific spoken words to you from the person that says the word. So Jesus is in the last meal with his apostles and he is saying, and many Bible translations prefer, and my saying abide in you. And what I have spoken to you, my promise, my instructions, uh, my co words of corrections, uh, everything that I have you know, may, taught you about life, about the kingdom of God, about, about you, your calling, about your mission, about me and you and you and me. If my sayings, the things that I have been communicating to you specifically, if this abide in you, then ask whatever. And that is that makes so much so much sense. And John chapter fourteen, verse twenty six, we read that the Holy Spirit, when He will come, will cause you to remember everything I said to you. And that that you can connect that when the Holy Spirit will come, He will cause you to remember all the sayings that Jesus has spoken to you. So here it says Jesus says. 
if my words, my seeing remain and you continue to be your guide, continue to be your inspiration. So Rema is specific promise, specific saying. Prayer and promise are linked together. There's a wonderful promise over here. But this wonderful promise is attached to having this condition filled in us. The Rima, the revelation of the Lord will be in us. The indwelling in our lives of the Rima, the inspired word of God, the specific promise of God. It's when God speaks to you, when this verse comes alive into your life, when, when an answer of you, you're in a crisis and this answer comes to you from the Word of God, a specific hope, a specific transformation, a specific correction, something that God speaks to you directly. That's what Jesus is talking about, it's that kind of, of Word. When the indwelling of the Rima of Jesus is in us, it inspires our prayer. It brings the insight and the revelation into what God wants us to know, do, the directions of God. If you remember in the, the, some of the first messages concerning the work of the vine dresser, one of the things that he was doing was uh, attaching, uh, tying some branches to the wire so that he would give the direction up to the branch specifically. So it's kind of something like that. If you abide in me, if your heart is really for God, and if the rima, the, the living promise of God is active in you, speaking to you, it's alive in you, when you will ask whatever you will, what are you going to ask? You are going to ask His will. You are going to ask his mind. You are going to ask what's pleasing to him. So this is not a blank check. God is not crazy about making that promise to you. He knows that if you abide here, what you, whatever you will ask will be okay with him to say, I will, it will come to pass. That's how much trust God has in his children. That is children that have committed, that are devoted to live that kind of life, the abiding life. If we don't live the abiding life, then forget about the promise of verse 7, it's not for you. But as soon as you say, Lord, I belong to you, I want to really honor you with my life, whatever is your plan for me, I say yes to that. This promise is for you. As amazing this promise is, it is, it is for you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When a believer in Christ is full of the rima of the Word of God, then faith is possible. Then faith is alive. Faith is big. You believe. You believe because it's been given to you as a direct imparting of the Holy Spirit. It is faith. And it directs your desire. And this way, this prayer of yours becomes a prophecy. Because whatever, look, look at that, it's just logical. Whatever you will, whatever you're asking for, it has been inspired and it has been directing and, and your, your life and your mind and to the will of God. So you are sure that by asking that, you are receiving. It's like a prophecy. You pray and it's like the prophecy is going to happen. You are praying, it's going to happen. Say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. It's the pledge, the guaranteed assurance of the answer. And this promise is a promise of who? Jesus. This is the promise of Jesus. This is not like a, a dark uh, text from the Old Testament, some, uh, uh, some like poetry text from the Psalms or anything like that. Some meditation of some great man of the Old Testament. This is Jesus leaving his apostles, giving this most outstanding promise to you. Amen? And John the Apostle, having lived that life of abiding for years and years and years, and First John, you see this text here, uh, go to the next one. Look at this verse here and compare this one to that one. This is the confidence. This is old, old man John 
after he has lived a life and experienced the abiding and the, prom the prayer working in his life, he says, we have this confidence in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Same promise, said in different words, years later addressed to general population of believers following Jesus. If you look at the last verse here, because I, I like the, the, just the wording of the verse 14, we can come to God with no doubts. This means that when we ask God for things, and those things agree with what God wants for us, God cares about what we see. God hears what we see. And the same repetition, and we know that if He has heard us, if He cares for us, if He agrees with us, we have what we have been asking for. That's the assurance. So I want to, to challenge e each one of us this morning for two things. First of all, is that believe, believe that outstanding promise of God that's given to you. But in order that it will be effective in your life, decide something. Are you going to live the life of abiding? Are you abiding in Christ? And is His Word abiding in you? And if it's not really clear, or it's like 50-50 or 60-40, whatever, just work that. Just make sure that you're not wasting your time, that you're not living on the 50-50 that you are devoted to see God's being glorified by the fruitfulness of your, of your life. Because if you do, this promise is for you. Let's believe God's promise. I mean, as I said in the opening, it's a big promise. It, I cannot even comprehend how big it is. And I cannot really fully understand. And many times I, I would have doubts in uh, praying such a bold prayer. But this is the promise of God that comes with a guaranteed, assured guaranteed of the result of that prayer. Imagine if we start living like that and praying like that, what will happen in our lives, in the life of our loved one, and in the life of the world. And this is the call of God to us, a command. Abide in me, let my word abide in you, and ask whatever you will and it will come to pass for you. Amen. Father God, thank you this morning for refreshing our faith and letting us see there is a difference between abiding and not abiding. And except we abide, there is no fruitfulness possible. But Lord, as you encourage your disciples, as you are leaving them to do the mission you entrusted to them, you left them with a deeper understanding of promise, of prayer. 